you on worship team, the ministry, music and song, and praise and worship. I don't believe this mic is on right now. I'll put it on. Okay, good. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 11 of chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of of my own age, among my people, I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to, into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us, is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. May the Lord add his rich blessing to his wonderful word. Let's look to the Lord before we look into his word. And Father in heaven, we do give thanks to you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for all that you've blessed us with in Christ Jesus. Lord, we as we look into your word, we ask that you would guide us and lead us, draw us closer to yourself. And at this time, we would be praying for those who may be going through difficult times, hearing of illness and those who are diagnosed with severe sicknesses. We would pray for them, Lord, that the sufficiency of your grace and an extra measure of it would sustain them would encourage them and that their hope would only increase in their time of uh, sickness. We pray for uh, Brad and Cassandra as they're planning a memorial for the, for the young uh, child that you, you brought to be with you, Lord. And, so, and we just pray that, that you would be comforting and encouraging them as they prepare uh, for this service. So Lord, we, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with in Christ Jesus and our time together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the question is, if you could be anybody in history, maybe somebody you know, or someone from the past, who would it be? Who would you want to be? Well, I remember, pardon? If you could be anybody in history, whether it be from the ancient past, pardon? Cleopatra. Oh, no, no. Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Cleopatra, she said no. Cleopatra. Yes. I'm going to be fed grapes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't sure where this question was going to lead us. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know as a young child, of course, there's your favorite uh, sporting athlete that you would look to, or perhaps uh, a girl, and it would be some princess, and uh, meeting her Prince Charming. And uh, isn't that the case, what happened to Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> amen? Do I get an amen from that too? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You'd be anybody. Well, how about this? Famous playwright, uh, political activist, and polemicist. You may know him by the name Bernard Shaw. He played the what if game shortly before he died. Mr. Shaw asked the reporter, if you could live your life over and be anybody you've known, 
or any person from history, who would it be? I would choose, replied Shaw, to be the man George Bernard Shaw could have been, but never was. Amen. Could have been, but never was. You see, this morning I would like to consider not what could have been. Could have, should have, wasn't. Oftentimes is our theme song. But this morning I want to consider, and looking at this passage that I just read, what can be, what we hope will be. Certainly we all can have regrets about the past, but we don't want to live in that lane even through this present year that God has given us. So as we consider Vision 2020 or 2020 Vision, spiritually it is making the most. Living your grace potential. Do you believe God has a purpose and a plan for your life? And there's a great potential there. You know, as we think of potential, oftentimes we might look at a young person and say, oh, there's so much potential. You know, and then time goes by, and before long you look in the mirror and you go, oh my goodness, I don't know about potential, but I've got a lot of things going on when I look into the mirror. And all that potential, has it translated into living and experiencing? <clears throat> and so this morning, we're talking about living the grace potential. Certainly the Apostle Paul would be one. We could all say, agree, boy, he lived the life. He lived the grace life. <clears throat> and so this book of Galatians is oftentimes, Paul in writing it, is oftentimes reflecting upon uh, himself and using himself as an example and talking about his experience. And we have much of uh, the New Testament to reflect upon Paul's life and what he did. He lived in the moment. He lived in the present. He lived the potential that God had planned for him. But when did it begin, this potential? He talks about a divine calling. Oh, Oh, why dost thou persecute me? Who art thou, Lord? Remember that? Well, there's a divine... You know what? If we want to live out the potential, the grace potential, that God uh, has planned for us, it begins with God. It begins with a divine call. And I would call this kind of call the when-what call. It's the when what call is a divine call. Because it talks about when it occurred. Paul's going to talk about when it occurred for him originally and what it was. Remember, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Galatia, he's defending who he is as what? A believer? Not primarily as an apostle. This is a, call, a divine calling to service, a divine calling to live our potential doesn't mean what we know, but what we do, what we can be. And so, as we consider verse 15, the Apostle Paul's talking about his calling in defending his apostleship. He was an apostle. And when did he say it occurs? But when God, who set me apart, from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. He set me apart from my mother's womb. Remember what kind of uh, calling this is? A what? Uh, a when? What? When did it occur? When were you called to be an apostle, Paul? Huh. I'll say, hey, God set me apart from my mother's womb. What? Yeah, that's how far back it goes. Paul is identifying with God's, uh, God's plan for his life while he was yet in his mother's womb. While God's knitting him together in the womb, God has a divine plan for Paul's life. This certainly supports the idea of life in the womb, doesn't it? It's similar to the language of Jeremiah in chapter 1 and verse 5, where Jeremiah writes, uh, where God's speaking to Jeremiah as he's going to send him off into service. God says this, before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, 
I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. To think of, uh, to think of life in the womb. And to understand that there's a purpose and a plan that God has for a, for a human being. Paul says, that's when God set me apart from the womb. You know, when we encourage people to uh, have hope, to, when we encourage people to know that they have a purpose in life, I don't know what your purpose in life for what you're going to do and who you're going to marry or what you're going to do and, you know, your trade or the type of work that you'll be engaged in. But I do know one thing, that God never makes junk. And he has a purpose and a plan for life when he's knitting it together in the womb. And we can all be encouraged. Perhaps an individual here even this morning is wondering, what's my purpose and what's my plan? I don't know from the things you'll do. But I do know the grace purpose and God has a grace purpose and plan for your life. And uh, this is what Paul was emphasizing in God calling him. It was a call. Remember, when, when did it occur? Well, it occurred, uh, you know, when, when Paul's mom was walking around uh, carrying this child, the infant Paul, in the womb. You know, uh, you wonder what thoughts were going through her mind. Or when the child was young. What was his purpose and plan? And yet God, who could have known, who could have thunk what would become of the Apostle Paul? What a great blessing he's been to the church over the centuries. Who would have thought that when he was in Rome? But the Apostle Paul, I don't even know how Paul comes to that conclusion on his own. Perhaps just by knowing the Old Testament and reading the, uh, reading the prophet Jeremiah or in Psalm 139 when, when David's writing or the psalmist is writing about God knitting him together while he's in that secret place in the wall. There's the calling of grace. And what was the calling of grace uh, when it actually did, though it, he was set apart for a purpose, God revealed himself at, at a certain time. And what did he do? He revealed his son in me. He called me by his grace, divine calling, and then he was pleased to reveal his son in me. This is primarily emphasizing service, not salvation. God was, your Bible may say he was revealing his son to me, my Bible says, in me. In other words, it was as God revealed his son. Once Paul turned to the Lord, once Paul became a child of God and a Christian, what was he going to do? God began working in his life. God began revealing his, his grace to him. To reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So when did it occur? What was it all about? It was about you being an apostle, you preaching the gospel. You had a purpose, not simply to be, not simply to be a child of God, but God set you apart to do something for Him. And we see that for Paul, it was uh, he was a mighty preacher and sent to the Gentiles. You see, the more we experience God's grace in our lives, the more we experience and understand His purpose and plans for our life. So as Paul was learning more about Christ and experiencing God's grace, he was learning more about that calling upon his life. So what was he going to do? It, if it begins, if, if turning that potential into a reality is understanding the calling of God upon our lives. Not only so, as it was for the Apostle Paul, it's experiencing his grace. What we read here is, uh, is just a few verses. 
But as we can see in verse 18, there's a few years involved. And then if we go into chapter 2, there's a few more years involved. It's not as if we're suggesting that God's going to reveal my whole life and what I'm going to do and what I'm going to go through right here, right now, or this year. There are many trials and tribulations, many steps forward, many curves and uh, hills and valleys in life's journey, but yet as we're experiencing God's grace, he's constantly pointing us in the direction to serve him and what he's called us to do. Perhaps God had equipped Paul in some ways for the journey that he was gonna, God was going to send him on. Even, in, even whether it be his intellect, whether, whether it be his skills, whether it be <clears throat> his abilities on a natural level, God, uh, that may have been part of the plan as God was weaving to get Paul together and setting him apart. And definitely as he, uh, his spirit came into Paul's life and of course he received the necessary spiritual gifts. <laughs> So what, what occurs next for the Apostle Paul is, again, another lesson that we can extract. Let me just share this uh, illustration as we continue on. The, the Japanese introduced a tree to the world that's called the bonsai tree. I don't know if you've ever had one of those trees. Um, you see, it's measured in inches instead of feet as other trees are measured. Why is that? You see, it was not allowed to reach anywhere near its full growth potential, but instead grows in a stunted form. The reason for growing in a stunted form is that when it was first, when it first stuck its head out of the ground as a sapling, the owner pulled it out of the soil and tied off its main tap root and some of its branch feeder roots and then replanted it. By doing this, its grower deliberately stunted its growth by limiting the root's ability to grow deep and take in enough of the soil's nutrients for a normal growth. You see, what was done to the bonsai tree can be done to us. And we can have a hand in that too. We can stunt our own growth spiritually, no matter what God's plans and purposes God is not going to pick us up and use us as puppets <coughs> in the divine plan of God. Uh, he calls us to serve Him. But no matter how great the calling, what will be our response? Will we enable that calling? Will we support that calling? Will uh, we uh, follow that calling, surrender to it? Will there be a deep connection to God so he can do that purpose in our lives? Or are we going to be like the bonsai tree and stunt our own spiritual growth? You see, we notice in Paul a deep connection about uh, his relationship. There was deep co uh, connection and conviction about his calling. What did he, in what he says, look, my immediate response in verse 16, it, it doesn't matter, the divine calling has to be followed up by a deep conviction. It can't just stay there or else uh, it will not come to fruition. But he says, my immediate response, I did not uh, consult any human being. What? That goes against, you know, uh, the counselor's philosophy of the day. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. And of course, he's talking about the, the, the 11 others. I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. He went into the Arabian. God called him to uh, be a, a, a preacher to the Gentiles. And he even identifies himself as being an apostle here. And he says, I didn't go see them, like looking for their approval. When we know that God really calls us, and there's a deep connection and conviction about it, we're not looking for the approval of man. And we're not going to allow the uh, 
the most uh, superficial or insignificant thing to cause us to take our eyes off of the Lord's calling for our lives. Certainly in the life of Paul, the revelations that he talks about um, that God gave him, that's unique. You know, whether it be in Acts chapter 9, or whether it be in Acts chapter 16, when Paul was at Corinth and he's preaching there, and God comes to Paul and says, don't, and the revelation says, don't fear them. Don't be afraid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to continue to preach. Or in Acts chapter 23, when he was in Jerusalem, and God in the revelation says, don't be afraid. You're going to go to Rome, and you're going to testify about me. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, what I received from the Lord, I, I say to you, in concerning the Lord's table. So, certainly Paul had some unique revelations from God uh, that uh, made, made the conviction deep and the connection deep. He knew his divine appointment. He proclaimed, he persisted, he was faithful, he was patient. Even when persecuted. When there is such confidence and assurance, we can see that one follows through as the Apostle Paul did. Teacher John Lafitte offers five, offered five signs God is calling you to the ministry. The number four reason he stated was this. People called to the ministry are hardwired for ministry. They're called, they are called to it as part of who they are and cannot be changed any more than you can change the color of your eyes. It's a hard wiring when God calls us to serve him in whatever capacity. It's not as if Paul was disrespectful to the, uh, those apostles or rebellious toward their message. However, he recognized that um, if God calls him to the ministry and to serve him, he was going to be faithful. The question is, what word does God use today to call you and I? What word does God use today? In Psalm 73, verse 24, it says, You guide me with your counsel all the days, and afterward you will lead me to glory. You guide me with counsel. So God counsels us. How does he counsel us? He counsels us through the scriptures. He speaks to our heart to lead us. He counsels us through it by his spirit. He whispers to our spirit. He counsels us with saints, fellow saints, to challenge us and challenge our souls. And of course, his circumstances lead us to a place of serving him. So there are many ways in which God still ministers to us and leads us and guide us, guides us so that we can truly turn all of that potential, God's plan for your life, into experiencing his purpose, living that grace in our lives. And finally, as we, uh, as we continue on in this passage and draw practical uh, application from it, finally, something else occurs. It's evident. Isn't it evident that God's calling was upon his life? How was it evident? What? Well, I think it's just God. <laughs> he endured. He, he endured. endured a lot. He endured a lot. Amen. He was forced to make a major decision in his life, which went completely against everything that he believed in. Ah. 180 degrees. When that light shone on. Yeah. We call it sock at the He had to work past his own guilt. He had to work past did. his own guilt? To work with the people that he persecuted. That's, so we, 180? That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we need opposite direction. And that's, 
what you folks are sharing here is evident in this passage that we read, isn't it? There was a described or demonstrated confirmation. When we are seeking to serve the Lord, and when we are turning that potential into a reality in living the grace uh, that God has called us to live in, in serving Him, there's confirmation usually. It'll be confirmed. Three ways in which it was confirmed in this passage that we read. Number one, in his beliefs. In his beliefs. Isn't that evident? Uh, as mentioned, it was a 180 degree turn. Look what he was. He, you know, this afternoon, later on, this evening, I suppose, um, there's going to be a football game on. Yeah, the Super Bowl. And one of the things about, you interview all of these players now, they're all saying, uh, all I want to do is do my part and I want to leave it all on the field. That's the, really the best they can do. In one sense, they want to win, but they can't control the score in one sense, but they can't control who they are and their responsibility. When, by leaving it all on the field, they mean that they, they want to give 100%. They don't want to have any regrets. And so you know what's going to be the confirmation of whether that's true or not? The 101 Monday morning quarterbacks. You and I. What's wrong with that guy? Come on, it's the Super Bowl. Couldn't he do something better? And all of those uh, people who will be analyzing and the cameras showing on the guy. Man, he really need to. He should have picked it up. No player wants to hear that. They want to leave it all on the field. And the greatest testimony is that there's a confirmation here that the Apostle Paul, he, this was translated, all of that, uh, but when it pleased God to separate me from my mother's womb, he proved it in his life, in his testimony, in his beliefs. Look what, he, he did end up going to the other apostles. Doesn't it say that when we read and in chapter 2, it's even followed up even more uh, by, uh, by him visiting the others, the other apostles. And it says in verse 7 of the, next, the, the following chapter, didn't read it in verse 2, they recognized that he had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He, he was confirmed by what he was doing. He wasn't looking for a pat on the back. But there was a support group who was confirming, you're doing the right thing. Not only saw, it says in verse 9 of chapter 2, they gave him the right hand of fellowship. Not the left hand of a fellowship, but the right hand of a sheep. Saying, come on. You're, what you're doing, they're, they're accepting it. Not only that, we're in agreement with it and we're participating with you. And not only so, they were in agreement, it says in verse 9. When Paul went to visit all the other apostles. So there's a testimony. What he believed, there should be a testimony when we go out serving the Lord. That what, we're, what we believe is important. Doctrine is important. And Paul wanted to make sure he is fighting for the gospel. And for the power of the gospel. The liberty of the gospel. The transforming power of the gospel. And he wants to see if these others are with him or not. That's important to him. And may we uh, be uh, reminded of that as well, even as we serve the Lord. We want to we preach and teach the truth. Even though we want to serve the Lord, our beliefs need to be in line with the scriptures. And God's plan. And God's plan. Not only so, not only was it in his belief so, we see that also it was in his behavior. <laughs> Something changed. What did we read about his behavior? Before I was persecuting the church, and now I'm, now I'm a preacher of the gospel. Look, he, he tried to destroy it, the church. As he said, I persecuted the church in verse 13 of God, the church of God, and he tried to destroy it. If, we're, uh, if we could be encouraged about one thing, the good news is the good news of second chances, uh, new opportunities. And uh, you see, Paul probably was converted to Christ at the age of around 30 years old. So there were a few years in there uh, where he, 
He was persecuted, but something happened. God, the gospel of grace changed his life. It was evident. And you see, there was a testimony that there was a changed life. It wasn't just talk, because look at the testimony uh, later on in this chapter of, uh, first, uh, of Galatians 1, when it says, I was personally, in verse 22, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So the word was out on the street. There's a God. His life has changed. We've seen it. We can't believe it. But God has changed his life. His behavior changed. And when we think of living uh, living our grace potential, it means God changing our life. Not what we were before or living according to the flesh, but living according to the Spirit and the grace of God is upon our lives. And finally, the third way in which it's a testimony of God's grace, it's uh, revealed here when it says what? In verse 24, finishing off the chapter, and they praise God because of it. You see, in service, as we serve, we are simply instruments. We are instruments to be used by God to bless the church. Not to ridicule the church, not to attack the church, not to hurt the church, but to bless it. And so there was a testimony that what? There was a confirmation is evident that he was blessing the church. Because it, see, it says they praise God because of him. May, may we be used by the Lord to bless the church. And they don't worship us. They don't praise us. But they give glory to him. Because we had a part in blessing them with the blessings of God upon their lives. And so they looked to the Lord and so as we think of this year, really having 2020 vision, may we recognize that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. May we also understand that we need to have our roots down deep. Deep conviction about what we're doing and what we believe. And allow Christ to work in us, that he might work through us. And finally, may there be a testimony. May there be a real uh, message that um, we have, a ch there's a change has happened. There's a demonstrated confirmation. That person is on the Lord's side. And so, as we think of what God has done for us, what a privilege it is in this year, 2020, to serve Him, that He might uh, be uh, glorified in and through us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Oh Lord, you would know in our own lives how at times we can be so indifferent about the great, the great blessing of knowing you, the great blessing of serving you. And Lord, you've equipped us, you've called us, May you reveal your son to us and in the process reveal what you would have us to do for your glory and honor from day to day. Encourage us, Lord, and may we encourage one another to bless one another. We thank you for all that we have in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray.